Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name's Alan, and I'm going to be talking about data visualization for humans in this talk. So this is very much going to cover the um, what and the why of data visualization, much less information on the how. So if you want more detail on frameworks you can use, tools you can use for visualizing data, I'm happy for to people to find me later and talk about that. Otherwise, there's going to be many other people at the conference who can also give you guidance on that. But the reason I want to focus on the what and the why is that's where I mostly encounter the problems that I find in the work that I do. And I'll talk more about that in a second. But before diving straight into just talking about data, what I want to do first is show you a visualization of data that literally changed the course of human history and saved millions of lives. Now, this does involve me talking about a pandemic, so I apologize for that, but it's not coronavirus. Back in the 19th century, the pandemic that was sweeping around the world and killing millions of people was cholera. And part of the reason why cholera was so dangerous is that doctors and scientists of the time didn't really understand how cholera spread. They had a kind of idea that it was spread through the air, through what they called miasma, clouds of bad air that would float between people and then between communities and then between countries. So their visual idea of what cholera looked like was a bit like this cartoon from a newspaper of the time, a cloud of death floating around the world. Then in the 1850s, there was a specific outbreak of cholera in Soho in London, and a doctor called John Snow decided he would take a more scientific approach to try to understand what was happening with this disease. So he took all the cases in the outbreak and he plotted them onto a map. And by looking at the map, he could then say, okay, is there a pattern here? Is there a cluster here? Is there some trend that I can understand in the data? This is what the map looked like. It's the original version, but it's been slightly enhanced with color here. And by viewing the data like this, instead of by viewing it as individual cases or by viewing it as tabular data, he was able to say, OK, well, maybe there are some patterns here. I can see that these cases are dragging towards the center of the map. And just to the left of the center, there's a particular cluster that you can see um, that he observed. So when he went out on the street and he walked around and he looked at what was at the center of that map, he realized that it was a water pump. It was the water pump that the people of Soho used for their cooking and their cleaning and their drinking water. So first of all, for himself, he was able to say, well, maybe cholera is something to do with the water. But crucially, he was able to use this kind of visualization to convince people in authority that it was the water supply we needed to look at. So that led to huge investments in sanitation, clean water supplies, sewerage, and gradually cholera was eliminated as a pandemic. So cholera still exists, but we know why it exists. Generally, it exists in poorer countries where we haven't fixed the water supply. So this is a historic example, but a good example of what we're trying to do with data visualization. We're trying to turn raw data that isn't going to make a lot of sense to anyone and turn it into something highly visual that we can understand very quickly and take decisions based on that understanding as well. So John Snow is known as one of the fathers of epidemiology. So a lot of the work being done today on COVID was building on what he did back in the 1850s. Uh, and he also has the biggest honor that you can give to a British person as well. He has a pub named after him. So if you go to the middle of Soho, if you find the John Snow pub, directly opposite that is the site of the water pump that he discovered. Now, there's lots of definitions you can read online about what data visualization is and what it's for. But this is a, a, an analogy or a comparison that I quite like from David McCandless. David McCandless is the founder of Information is Beautiful. They do a lot of lovely work in this area. You can check out their website and see the kind of things that they produce. But he says, by visualizing information, we turn it into a landscape you can explore with your eyes, a sort of information map. And if you're lost in information, an information map is kind of useful. So I like this comparison point of an information map. We're trying to present data in a way where people can understand where they are now and where they could potentially go next. We're trying to give them an idea of high points and low points. We're trying to give them an idea of places of interest and places to avoid. Um, and obviously, we're trying to do this all visually because for most people, visuals are much easier to understand and much quicker to understand than numbers are, or in fact, text is as well. So what's the upside for us in putting this work in and actually doing this stuff? Well, there are always going to be benefits for you or your organization, and these are the ones that I tend to see the most often. Firstly, you speed up decision making. So you make it easier for people to absorb the information you're presenting them with and take decisions or take actions based on that understanding. That reduces friction. It reduces arguments. It just means that everything is flowing a lot more seamlessly. 
Secondly, if you work in any way with data, if you're on a team that is working with data, then you will know that you can get buried within any organization with ad hoc requests for data. This is people coming to you from different parts of the organization and they want a particular number or they want some data over a particular date range and quickly you are buried under those requests and all you're doing is reactive work to give people back these, these one-off requests. Now, by visualizing the data and by empowering people to interrogate the data to an extent themselves, then you can bounce away those ad hoc requests and you can start to do a lot more proactive work, which is maybe more strategic, maybe more based on actually finding insights. And also, although I'm going to be talking about we want to try and make things as simple and easy to get as, as possible, we are constantly trying to raise the data literacy of everyone in our organization. That crucially does not just mean developers or data scientists or analysts. It means everyone within the organization should be getting more comfortable with and more able to interrogate data and make decisions based on data. Now, people have tried to avoid that. People try and hide, and they don't like using spreadsheets, or they don't want to look at numbers, and they, there's less and less spaces to hide. Most organizations know from the top down that they want to be guided by data. Visualization is a way that we can encourage people to do that, and we can empower people to do that. Data literacy is not a static point. We, don't, we probably need to meet people where they are right now, but that doesn't mean we can't raise what they're able to do in the future. Um, and one uh, chief data officer that I was talking to fairly recently has stopped using the, the, the words data literacy and started using data fluency instead for these kind of conversations. Fluency implies more of a, a gradation or, or a, a flow between the state of, of maybe you can order a coffee through to you speak like a native. Literacy is a bit more binary. You can read or you can't. And so fluency maybe describes better what we're talking about here. Now, I know the logo slides are, slides are boring, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's a couple of things that I should always mention at the start here. Firstly, I don't come at this from a data point of view. I don't come from a computing background. I didn't, I'm not a PhD. My background is in journalism. So that's where I started out working with this kind of stuff. Initially, you, uh, through things like maps and infographics and diagrams as ways of conveying information to readers or to uh, users of a website. I then moved into more tech roles, and then what I've been doing for the best part of the last decade is working with a whole range of different organizations on how they're communicating with data. So some of that is internal, reporting, dashboards, that kind of thing, slide decks, a lot. Um, some of that is external, which might be pitch decks, it might be marketing materials going out to potential customers, or it might be ways of explaining products to existing customers, for instance. Um, the second thing to say here is I work with a real wide range of organizations. Some of them are tech companies. A lot of them are not. They have a lot of data, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it. They might be larger corporates. They might be public sector, um, some larger charities, and a few startups. But the problems or the challenges are fairly consistent. The things that I see coming up over and over again, and the reason I've titled this talk in the way that I have, is that most of those problems are to do with human beings and trying to get understanding from human beings much more so than problems with data. Now, I'm not saying data isn't complicated. Of course it is, in terms of the variety, the volume, the velocity and, and, uh, of the data you've got coming in. But actually, data does, and technology generally, do what you tell them to do. Like, they do perform in fairly predictable ways. Humans don't. And so humans are always going to be the more problematic part of the equation. I've never met a kind of database that won't talk to an API because they fell out at the Christmas party. But with humans, you have to deal with these kind of tensions all of the time, within de between departments, between individuals. So if you are a developer or you work with any kind of data, in my view, there are three broad areas you might have to be using data visualization. And those are these. And my clicker stopped working. Um, firstly, there's data analysis. Um, exploratory data analysis, this is where you're going through a data set and you might be tipping out any number of different um, graphs and charts to understand the data set for yourself. Now, I'm going to talk about this less because in some ways this is less challenging. You can do this over and over again until you get the insights that you want and you are probably a fairly knowledgeable human being approaching this. But the other types of uh, data visualization are either in presentations, which could be you've been asked to come up with some kind of insight by higher up people within the organization, uh, or you are making a business case for something, you want to make a change to a product, you want some investment in a particular area. Um, and a lot of this involves producing slide decks and pu probably pulling quite simple slices of data out of what is a much bigger data set. And the third thing is dashboards. 
Now, because we're going through this process of trying to empower everyone within organizations to understand data and to be able to make decisions based on data, this increasingly means presenting them with self-serve options where they can log on and they can see the latest snapshot of whatever data, uh, th th whatever data we want to display to them. So I'm gonna focus mo more on those second two parts in this talk. So let's start with presentations. Um, really have lost my place here. So the problems I see with presentations are predominantly that people focusing from the data point of view, bearing in mind this is a very intuitive way to go around. You need to present some data, so you start with the data and you work outwards, outwards from there. That can lead to a couple of different problems. One of them is data without sufficient context. Now the examples I'm gonna use are not examples that I worked on with my clients because I'd be in breach of all manner of NDAs, but these are representative examples that I can find out in the wild. And this one is more of an infographic in style, but bear in mind the client here was IBM and this was created by a creative agency. Um, and what we have here is a whole bunch of numbers. Now I see this a lot. The, here's a l bunch of numbers about a subject. You can do this about any subject, it's always possible. It doesn't mean there's any meaning there at all. These numbers are very varied. We have a uh, number of emails sent every second in millions, data consumed by households each day in megabytes, videos uploaded to YouTube every minute in hours, and so on. The problem with just presenting numbers like this is obviously we're completely lacking in context. So these numbers cannot be compared to one another. I mean, technically you could do megabytes, petabytes, and exabytes, but it's quite hard to do in your head. But you definitely can't compare millions to megabytes to hours. Also, we have very little context to the numbers in isolation as well. So apparently 50 million tweets per day. Well, I have literally no idea if that means that Twitter is about to close tomorrow because no one's using it, or it's the most popular social media platform on the planet. I have no point of reference for 50 million tweets. Visualization is an opportunity for us to provide that context. If you're gonna tell me 50 million tweets, then show me how many Instagram posts there are per day, and at least I have some kind of ballpark. Or give me an idea of how many tweets per day were there last week, how many are there likely to be next week, what effect is Elon Musk having, and you give me some idea of trajectory by doing that. So numbers without isolation is, is a, a thing that I see fairly often. Or, uh, sorry, numbers without context, in isolation without context. Or too much context. Too much context is definitely a thing. This is where we're, there's a lot of nuance in the data, and we need to provide all of the different measuring points, averages, comparison points. This is an example from the BBC. Um, and what we end up with with this is just total overwhelm. People are not able to interpret what they're being presented with because there's just too much for their eyeballs to do when they look at that page. They don't really understand where their starting point is, what they're supposed to be comparing with what, how the time ranges work, uh, and so on. So what we really need before we get tangled up in design is some kind of starting point to clarify what we're trying to do when we're presenting data using visualization. And I think there are three components that we can always define right at the start of the process that will give us the best chance of success. And those are audience, story, action. Now this isn't really to do with data. This is boiled down very basic communications theory. But what I find is that unlike when people are gonna give a presentation like I'm doing now or they're about to send an email, people will forget these things when they're presenting data. We're still trying to communicate with data. That's fundamentally what we're trying to do when we're visualizing it. So audience is who are we talking to? Story is what do we wanna tell them? And action is what do we want them to do about it? So I'm gonna talk about each one of those in turn. So audience, first of all, who are we exactly are we presenting the data to? The more specific, the better. So if it's a particular team within your organization, is it a particular segment of your customers? The more you know about these people, the easier it's going to be to tailor a visualization to be at the right level of understanding and also focus on what they're likely to be interested in or what their motivations are. How much do they know about the subject we're talking about? If it's the people sitting next to you at work, they should have a lot of contextual information about what the business does, what the products are that you have, and so on. If you're talking to potential customers, then maybe they don't even know who you are or why they should be listening to you. So your starting point is very different. How data literate are they? Are they people who are used to looking at visualizations of data or raw data all day, every day? Or are they people who aren't? In which case, we know that we need to simplify this down. We know that we need to make this something that's more accessible. Are they likely to be hostile to what you're about to tell them or receptive to what you're about to tell them? If you're going into a room to give people good news, I promise you, you can do a lot less work on the visualization. They're gonna take whatever you give them, they're gonna drag it out your hands. 
If you're going into a room to tell people that based on the data you've looked at, everything they've done for the last year is wrong, you're going to have to back up your argument. You're going to have to be more persuasive. You're going to have to prepare for questions. So knowing that going in will help you understand how you're going to visualize it. And also under audience, I would put, how are they receiving the information and how long are they going to spend with it? It's a total myth that there is one great way to visualize any given data set. It's all contextual. It all depends on where it's going to appear and to who. So is it going to be a slide deck where I have a big advantage that I can talk to you at the same time? I can potentially answer questions. Or is it going to be a printed report that they're going to take home in their bag and read page by page but in isolation from you? Or is it going to be an image on social media, in which case you have half a second to grab their attention and then it's gone and they're not going to delve any deeper than that? These things are all bullet points, and the good news is if you're going back to the same audiences multiple times, you can probably do this work once and then maybe revise it occasionally. Secondly, your story. What is the key message or the bottom line? And really, you should be able to sum this up in a single sentence, and the kind of sentence you could read out loud without running out of breath, that kind of sentence as well. Um, if you've got a lot of data, you'll come out with a lot of different stories. If you've done a big piece of analysis on user behavior with a product over six months, there's going to be lots of different themes or, or stories you want to pull out. That's fine, but I would think about telling one story at a time when you come to present this back and probably putting those in priority order. Because understanding the story in the data, which you can only do through your own data analysis, will help you understand what do we need to include to tell that story, and what can we potentially leave out entirely? What doesn't need to be there because it doesn't relate to what we're talking about? We're not hiding that stuff. We can give people access to the raw data if they need to, if they want to check some numbers for themselves, but we're choosing to leave it out of the visualization. That first step of simplification helps much more later on. And also, this should start to lead us towards what is the best visual approach. Because now our starting point, instead of being, how do I fit all of, it, all of these numbers in a spreadsheet or a table into a visualization, our starting point is, what's the best visual way to tell this story? Um, and how simple can we make that? And the third thing is the action. If we're talking to that audience and we're telling them that story, what exactly do we want them to do about it? If you cannot define an action at all, my question always to people is, do you need to present this data at all? Nobody is walking around asking to be shown more data, not even me. So if you, there's a way that you can just not present it, that's the ideal situation. But if there is an action, what is that action? Is it quite specific? Click here, buy this, you know, do this, that kind of action. Is it something more involved? Is it uh, based on this problem that we've identified in, in the data, you as the audience need to go away and come up with a solution or a range of solutions for that problem? Do you want people to change their behavior in some way? Absolutely the hardest thing to get people to do. So you probably want to try and break that down. And whatever you're identifying as the action, you always want to try and make it achievable for your audience and measurable by you. So that is avoiding actions like, let's all try harder at this, or let's change the world. Because with the best of intentions, those things never, ever get done. So we want to try and make it something achievable. So if I wanted to convince everyone in my local neighborhood to live a more eco-friendly lifestyle, then next to my amazing visualization, I might have a first action that is download my PDF guide to green living, or sign up for my newsletter where I'm going to give you weekly tips, or come to this online event where I'm going to explain more. It's not the ultimate thing I want them to do, but I know that I can get them over that first hurdle. So that's a basic framework for presentations. Dashboards are in, uh, complicated in a couple of different ways. Um, one of them is, I've been saying, identify the story in the data and then build your design around that. With dashboards, we've kind of already created this structure and we're pouring new data into it uh, on a regular time uh, basis so that it's up to date. So we don't know the story before we've created the, the visual structure, if you like. But also, the main thing that dashboards suffer from, and we all know this, is just information overload. Dashboard design is a bit of a car crash in a lot of places. Often these things start out very simple, and then there are more and more requests. Can we add this? Can we add this? Can we have another dial that shows this? They kind of collect things like barnacles on a ship until you end up with something that is completely impossible for someone to interpret. So from a design point of view, my rule of thumb for dashboards is that any given view on a dashboard should have a similar level of complexity to the dashboard of a car. That's really what we're aiming for. That's the amount of information that people can take in in, in one go. Now, the word dashboard originally um, came from uh, a horse and cart. It was a piece of wood at the front that stopped mud being dashed up at you by the horse's hooves. So that's a pub fact for everyone. Um, when we moved into automobiles, it, got, it became the piece of wood at the front. That's where we started to put the instrumentation. 
Now, if I'm driving along in a car, I get a very limited set of KPIs that are on the actual dials in front of me. It tells me how fast I'm going, how much en the engine's turning over, how much fuel I've got. It doesn't tell me constantly what's happening with the vac right shock absorber, even though a modern car could probably do that. So there's some criteria that we're applying here to limit what we're trying to show people at any one time. So I, I can boil that down to three criteria. That I think in most cases, it, you should apply to anything that, that uh, somebody is requested to be on a dashboard. Firstly, anything that's on there should be mission critical for the project or the organization, whatever the dashboard is about. So that is numbers that matter. If this number goes up or it goes down, it actually has a material effect. It's not something that's nice to have. It's not something that cumulatively gently goes up through time. It's numbers that if they move, they matter. Secondly, you want things that change often, and often can be defined by how often is someone going to look at the dashboard. Because numbers that stay static, human beings are very good at blanking things out that they don't think are important. So if a number has been the same for three months, then people have stopped looking at it. You want things that, that will fluctuate. And because they're going to fluctuate, you want clear indicators of when they're in a good place and when they're in a bad place. So this, n this number is going to go up and down. It's only when it goes up to here that we have to worry or when it goes down to here that we have to worry. If we go back to the car example, these dials do follow those criteria. We're looking at stuff that is mission critical. How fast am I going? How much fuel have I got? These dials will move around, which will keep my interest. And if they go into a bad place, there's a red bit on the dial that will tell me, OK, now you need to do something about this. This is something that's, that's going wrong. There's one type of data that doesn't necessarily fulfill these three criteria, but it's worth noting, which is numbers that are mission critical but don't change very often. Um, so the way to handle those kind of numbers is more in the form of alerts of some type or another. So we don't have to add a dial to measure those things, but we can just have a simple rule that's set up somewhere that says if this number drops below this point, we pop something up on the dashboard to tell people, or we email this group of people. Alerts are normally the way of handling that. Also with dashboards, you want to think quite carefully about what level of dashboard or type of dashboard are you designing at any one time. And there's three uh, types that I would definitely identify, operational, analytical, or strategic. So operational dashboards, you can imagine being like uh, if you uh, run an ambulance service. I do some work with health organizations in the UK. Um, if you run an ambulance service, then an operational dashboard will be showing you how many ambulances do I have, how many are out on calls right now, what calls are coming in, what are the severity of those calls. It's very much the minute-by-minute -minute deployment of resources, what's happening right now. Definition of right now would depend on your organization, but often if you have people in tech teams who are um, looking at the servers and, and the actual performance of a product, they're looking at exactly what's happening at any one moment. Most people don't need that stuff. Most people within the organization probably don't need that granularity or that, that constant updated uh, data. A step back from that is analytical dashboards. This is looking more for patterns. This is looking for trends. This is where are the consistent problems that we're identifying? What's the seasonality look like? Uh, what repeated patterns are we seeing that we might want to uh, either replicate somewhere else or we might want to try and remedy in some way? So that is taking one step backwards. And then strategic dashboards are generally used at senior levels of an organization, and they're used to look at, are we going generally in the right direction? Is this the way we want to, he to, to be heading? Uh, this is often looking at um, deeper uh, insights into how, what effect are we having on our customers, for instance, um, lifetime value, all of those kind of things come in at that stage. So it's worth trying to think, which of those are we trying to design, because it will feed into what we're doing. Now, I also mentioned uh, that that level of simplicity, the, the dashboard of a car, is what I would like to see for any one view on a dashboard. Now, when I say view, um, if it was a printed piece of paper, that would be one dashboard, and then you might have another page two and a page three. As we've moved dashboards online, we obviously have the ability to create layers of information. And these layers might be navigable through the form of filtering, maybe. I could split my organization by department or by product and see different views, uh, similar views, but on different data by slicing them that way. Or it might go through levels of the organization so that senior, uh, senior uh, C-suite type people are looking at a helicopter view and gradually people are able to go deeper down. All of that is enabled by the fact that we can create layers of information when we're producing digital uh, dashboards. So effectively a stack of information that goes back into the screen rather than having to appear sequentially. 
Um, so whenever you see a fancy kind of interactive visualization, always remember that it's just built around this idea of layering. You can see them in lots of different places, but drill downs, filtering, all created using the same concept. Now, within either presentations or dashboards, you're going to have to do some selection around choosing different types of graphs and charts to present things. Now, there's a lot of detail you can go into here, but I'm just going to give you some starting principles for this. Because although we, um, we might be making these decisions by default or by preference, personal preference, I kind of like that type of chart for this type of data, there is some science around this, and there are ways to check that you're, choosing, you're, you're selecting the optimum way of presenting a certain type of data. So our old favorite pie charts, if I give you this pie chart here, I think if I ask you to identify which of those slices of the pie is the biggest, um, the responses I generally get here are either that it's a trick question and they're all the same, uh, or that it's just very difficult to distinguish between them, which is certainly correct, or that the actual colors here, the numbers are so close together that the actual boldness of all the hues of the colors might be slanting you in one direction, all of which is true. If we flip those numbers and just put them into a column chart instead, then exactly the same numbers are much more easy to discern the differences between. Now, this is not just a kind of random party trick. This is something that's been studied as far back as the 1980s. Um, Robert uh, Cle Cleveland and William McGill. William Cleveland and Robert McGill? It might be that way around. Apologies. Cleveland and, Mc and McGill, anyway. They first looked at graphical perception and looked at what were the basically shapes that were easiest for people to discern, particularly when we're talking about small differences in size uh, or, or underlying numbers. Now, this is actually a scale, so top left is, is the easiest, and it goes down then to bottom right, which are the hardest. And it's not to say that the ones that are harder are impossible. If there are huge differences in numbers, then things like shading or color saturation, which is what you would see in heat maps, for instance, it's perfectly easy for people to distinguish. But as the, the changes get smaller, as numbers get closer together, it's harder to tell the difference between those things. Along the middle, you see things like angle, area, volume, curvature, and that's where pie charts sit. Generally, we're asking people to di distinguish between area when we're looking at a pie chart. If the numbers are dramatically different, that's quite easy to do. As they become closer together, it becomes more difficult. So generally, we're trying to stick to the things that use stuff like length and direction, line charts, bar charts, uh, column charts. Those things are the easiest for people to distinguish between, particularly if you're talking about at-a-glance type information, which is dashboards, or particularly if you're talking about human beings and audiences who are not particularly data literate. Keep it as simple as possible. If you want a reference point for this, as well as Cleveland McGill, the data visualization catalog is a uh, data viz uh, catalog, I'm pretty sure it is, .com. Uh, free tool created by an information designer, and it has the advantage you can go into this either by type of chart, um, <coughs> and it will tell you how an area chart works and give you the, the anatomy of it and so on, but you can also go into it by function, which means your starting point can be the data I need to display is about comparisons or is about change through time. It will then suggest the best set of options for you. And finally, I just want to talk about some design finessing tricks that we can apply over the top of what we've already been talking about. So these can work equally well on dashboards, but also in presentations of data. Because when it comes to trying to improve the design of data visualizations, I find that people generally default to a what can I add to this to make it better type approach. So they've got an initial version of something, and they think, what else can I put on the page? I'm going to give you a simple example of why that's a bad idea. This is, again, probably not what you're producing in, in your day-to-day -day work, more of an infographic. But the problem with adding stuff to a visualization is that anything visual we put on the page, there is an expectation on the part of the human beings looking at it that that thing will have some kind of meaning, will, will be, uh, have some kind of importance. That's why it's on there. So this example here, the customer interface is the crucible of competition. Businesses are focused on. And then there's four things businesses are focused on. It's based on some kind of survey. Um, I can see why they used that telescope. It's because they said focused on, so they've used the telescope. But as soon as I look at that, the first ex expectation I have is that that telescope should add up to 100%. It doesn't matter that it's not a pie chart. It's one whole shape. It should be 100%. My math isn't that good, but I can quickly see that that's not going to happen. Then I'm looking at, okay, I also expect these segments of the telescope to get bigger in proportion to the number that's written inside them, really, as well. That's not happening either. 53 looks like the biggest, most important thing on the page. Why is it taking up more space? Because they had more words to write underneath, and that's not a good enough reason for it to have expanded in that way. 
I've also never seen a telescope that has these weird pennants hanging off the bottom, but they needed somewhere to put the words. And finally, the telescope requires the guy at the end um, who's not adding any information and doesn't know how to use the telescope because he has his eye open while he looks in the end of the telescope. All these things came from one decision, which was focused on and then telescope. This is what I tend to call decoration, and it rarely works to improve what you're doing. So what we normally need to do is think the other way around. This guy, Jeffrey Crowther, was uh, the editor of The Economist in the 20th century, responsible for building The Economist into a, a major publication with a lot of data in it. And he said to his journalists and his analysts, simplify, then exaggerate. So his point was, if you write for The Economist, you're an expert at something, whether it's a part of the world, a type of industry, type of business. Um, as an expert, you should be able to pull out the one thing that everyone else needs to know about that subject right now. So you're using your expertise as a kind of filter to say, of everything I could be talking about, this is the one thing that's most important. Then you're going to explain why it matters, why people could, uh, should care about it, what they should do about it. That's the exaggeration bit. You can think about this as a way of selecting the story in the data, but we can also apply this in terms of design, which is you try and remove anything that just doesn't need to be there. Almost err on the side of removing too much. There are some quite dramatic examples of that um, in data visualization. This one from Professor, Professor Ed Hawking at uh, the University of Reading, um, producing distilling down climate data into these climate stripes to show relative temperature from 1850 to 2017. I think those dates are right. Um, and with the colors denoting whether the uh, year in question was colder or warmer um, than surrounding years. Um, now, this is probably way too far in one direction for what most of us are producing, but it shows how far you can go in this idea of simplify down, simplify down. Now, one problem we can hit with trying to simplify down all the time is we get to the point where we're, re we're removing data, and I've said, if it doesn't relate to the story you're telling, maybe remove it entirely. That does open ourselves up sometimes to accusations of bias or of cherry picking or of not being transparent. So there's another way that we can include things on a visualization but make it very visually clear we don't want people to focus on them. Human beings are very good at being led by not just shapes, which is graphical perception, but also things like colors. Some of you will have seen this trick before, but I'm going to reiterate it for those who haven't. Here's a simple grid of numbers. If I ask you to count how many threes there are in that grid, um, you can do it. There isn't a trick here. But you can feel your brain start to slow down as you carry out the task. If I reach for the simplest color shift I can, which is to put in one color what I want you to look at and a different color what I don't want you to look at, then the same block of numbers then takes more like three seconds, and you're much less likely to make a mistake. That shift of colors, shift of perception on the part of um, uh, your audience, uh, that works on every type of visualization. You'll see it used on things like line charts. Um, to have some data in there for context, but drop it into the background. And if you're worried about make, using gray to do it, because you do tend to lose identity between the lines, then when you end up with a terrible line chart like this, which is frequently what happens when you've dropped something uh, out of a database and this is what it gives you, then instead of using gray, you can anything you want to drop into the background, you can make a more kind of pastel or opaque shade of the color it's in and create this kind of effect quite easily. These are the sort of design tricks that you will see used all the time by some of the publications, newspapers, uh, for instance, or magazines that are good at presenting data. Um, and I would recommend the Financial Times as one place where you can see this, these kind of techniques applied in sequence. They have a very clear idea of the story they're telling. They use very, very simple charts and graphs to display data. Um, and they use those simple design tricks like graying out to drop things into the background. So. Finally, I just want to talk about a few of the more common problems that I see coming up when people are trying to do this, this stuff within their organizations. One of them is the problem of having lots of different audiences, often for the same data set. So there's a few ways to approach this. Firstly, I would say it's always worth thinking in terms of having two areas for whatever it is you're producing, what I would call a story layer and a detail layer. Into the detail layer, you can put anything and everything you need to. Raw data, tables, methodologies if you need to, other data sources. Into the story layer, you only put the stuff that is relevant, pertinent, needs to be raised, as I identified as, as the story in the audience story action approach. This means that if you have multiple audiences, then you're just thinking in terms of having a different story layer for each one, rather than thinking we have to redo all of this analysis and this entire report for every single audience. Um, also, it means that if people have particular questions about a, a number they want to check, or if they disagree with your conclusions, part of the 
pulling out a story means that someone may disagree with you and they want to do the work for themselves. That's fine. We have an area that they can go to. We're not, being, we're not hiding anything. They can go and check that for themselves. A couple of other problems. Too much data. The only real solution to this, and everyone has too much data, by the way, every single organization has more data than they could ever present in one go. So inherently, we need to be selective. You're always trying to tell one story at a time. And if it is a complex narrative, if they are interlinked with each other, then progressive reveal, and that is using the layers that I talked about, if you're talking about presenting things via a dashboard, or just sequentially presenting stories through a slide deck, um, so you start out with maybe a helicopter view of the data, and you're gradually going into more and more details. And you can always allow for queries. So what I mean by that is you will get to a point where visualization is not going to be enough for a given audience. They're going to want to be able to look at it for themselves. Now, that's where you just allow them to do that. Empower them to be able to interrogate the database, um, understand the data for themselves. You need to do that carefully, particularly if they're not data experts. But if they're getting to the, the, end, the edge of what you're able to present them with, they're not finding that useful enough, then they need to be able to step off and do it themselves. And the final very common um, uh, challenge is unclear objectives in the first place. What are we trying to do with this data? Visualization will not rescue you if you didn't know what you were trying to do in the first place. This particularly comes in with things like dashboards, where you've been asked to create a dashboard for some audience, and they don't really know what they want from it, and therefore you don't know, and so you end up with something that you're constantly going back and forth with trying to fix. Really, with this, you're building a product of some description. You need to approach it in the same way. You want to take a kind of UX approach to doing this, understanding their requirements. Don't give them what exactly what they asked for. Understand what they were trying to do, and think about the best way to enable them to do that. Um, so you're focusing on the actions they're trying to carry out. Find friendly members of whatever the audience is you're trying to build for and see if they can help you with it and you can bounce ideas off them and be prepared to iterate. It's very unlikely that your first version of anything is going to uh, exactly tick the boxes for everyone. So I'm getting towards the end of my time now. So just a few key points of summary and then I'm going to give you one example of a visualization. So start with the audience. I said data visualization for humans. The biggest thing, reason that I see um, data visualization not working is there isn't a clear idea of what this what we intended the audience to take out of it what their level of understanding was what they needed to know about or what actions they need to carry out there is going to be a story in the data it might just be down to your opinion but it's a professional opinion it's a knowledgeable opinion give people your view on what that data says um, dashboards need to be focused I talked about different types operational strategic and so on but also um, simplifying down how much appears on any given view of the dashboard and always remember from a design point of view simplify then exaggerate so my example of data visualization is probably not what you would expect but this one discovered on Facebook actually ticks all the boxes that I talked about for presenting data uh, this is a um, drawn in pencil by a child uh, and it's a bit word heavy, but I will read it out to you. It says, um, I'm sorry, Ben, I didn't mean to hurt you. I feel like crap. Uh, I love you, and I was trying to hit Chris. I hate Chris. I hate my choice I made. I really hope you accept my apology. When I threw the scissors, I was aiming for Chris. I hope you start to feel better soon. And then this lovely visualization at the bottom where we have an axis with love and hate on it and a seesaw that has Ben and Chris on it. Now, it could do with some design work. I, I totally agree with that, but it pretty much ticks all the boxes. I know what the, who the audience is, I know what the story is, and I know what action they wanted to carry out, which is to be forgiven for hurling scissors at the wrong child. Um, so I think I'm coming in just two minutes short, which means I might be able to take a question or so until I'm told not to. So thank you very much, everyone. Any question down the front, and I'll repeat it back. Okay, good question. So the question was, what's my opinion on animations? Animations can be decoration, and as I described it, when they're just there as an effect. But animation, when it's used well, uses the layering that I've talked about. Because if you're talking about interactivity, we can the user can drill down through different layers of the data using filters or drill downs or whatever. In animation, we're just turning that into a flick book that we can, it's, it's like 1920s animation. So the progressive revealing of a narrative, the progressive revealing of data, it can be very, very powerful when it's used well. But it needs to be used to tell a story, not added as a decorative effect over the top. That would be my opinion. Any 
another question that was liked on there. Oh, question back here. Uh, yes, I don't know how slides are generally being shared, but um, you can find me on my email address there, or you can find me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to share them directly. Um, if I do get requested to share them through Oradev, then I'll be doing that as well. Happy for people to have a look at them. Okay. So if anyone wants to ask me one-on-one -on -one questions, I'll obviously hang around here for a little while, and you can find me at the rest of the events. Um, but thank you very much for your attention and uh, to the event.